It is 5.06 p.m. on Monday, September 20th, and the Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. Um, all of the commissioners are... Recording in progress. <laughs> That's good. Where'd that come? This is not hooked up to any of that. <laughs> yeah. That's Roger and Vince. Yeah. Commissioners Prevo, Smith, Ambrosino and Gedankin are present in person, and uh, Commissioner O'Connell is connected by Zoom. Um, General Manager Sullivan is here, and a representative from HCTV, and Select Board Chair Eric Remick is also in attendance. So a quorum is present. Um, I had. Uh, emailed with Mike about modifying um, the agenda to have, oh, this is modified now. No, it's not. Um, to have net meter, uh, not net metering, to have Brooke at the end of the agenda uh, so that we have the public discussion with her and the executive session at the very end. Um, any objections to that? Nope. Okay. Oh, I also, um Eli's going to slide in at roughly 5.30, I told him. Okay, great. But he's flexible. Um, we might get, uh, we'll see. Okay. Can we contact him if we need to do it yeah. earlier? Great. Okay, and will he join over the Zoom link? I sent him the Zoom link. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. So uh, we have minutes of one previous meeting, and I think Mike, you said that there was, you sent something, I saw it as I was leaving, yeah. so I yeah, think. Yeah, that was for the August meeting. Okay. I just realized I only put one set in this afternoon. So. Okay, so we have we the. We do them next month. Yeah, so we have the, but, all right. We have the minutes from the um, meeting of July 19th. Um, is there any discussion about them? These are the ones you discussed and had me modify. Okay, uh, yeah, I just found one typo, um, which I can pass on. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move. We'll move to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Any objection? Hearing none, the minutes are approved with the typo corrected. Uh, and Mike, in terms of the minutes from the August meeting, if you would still post those yeah. as draft. That would be good. Where's um, the typo so I can mark it? Oh, the type, uh, here. Perfect. Okay, uh, we have public. <laughs> Is Eric? Oh, welcome, Eric. Eric. Eric, you. Eric's the public. So I'm Eric Ramick. I'm here uh, for the Hardwood Trails as the, um, the Hardwood Trails would like to add a little more single track to the north of Billings Road. And I uh, emailed with Lynn and Mike about this a little, and then it seemed appropriate to come and just discuss with the entire board, because this is land that's deeded to the village of Hardwick, which then becomes the town of Hardwick after the merger. It's, um, uh, but it's, um, sometimes listed as an asset of Park Electric, so you guys are, we're all sort of in partnership on it, or at least that's how it's proceeding. Recording in progress. And recording in progress. We, we've got so, to stop. So I just tried to, um, unfortunately, I apologize, my printer is poor, so the first page, I give you a handout, the first page just has a list, list of, sorry, map of existing trails. The colored ones are the ski trails, and the gray ones that are squiggly are a single track. And the second page, which is, okay, so this is hard to see. The second page has the yellow line is an existing single track um, trail north of Billings Road and uphill or east of the solar system. And then very faintly, uh, to the north of that, and oh. to the west, is a dotted blue line that you can just barely make out. That's the proposed new trail. Oh. And I try, this is the biggest fail, is probably the third page. Recording in progress. I, I tried to, um, I tried to show the parcel data so you could see, you know, what was on which parcel the 
this is just so oh, good. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, it's very useful. So, um, but, so, uh, you know, I talked with, I had a, several email exchanges with Mike, and mm -hmm. um, there was concern about a confirmation. I, I, I broke uh, I can't hear them at all. Oh, well, I think we're well, disconnected, maybe? No, you're not disconnected. Yeah, I think they're, 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 uh, uh, their data signal must just not be good enough. Oh, that could be. It's just on the Can you hear now? Can you hear now, Vince? I can do it. Oh, so maybe it's just because I'm way over Yes, there. I can. So why don't we, the speaker right now is Eric, and he's not near a microphone, so can maybe we'll just come over by you and... Yeah, sure. That's a, good idea. <laughs> There's a chair right next to Mike. I would, sure. So I guess... Let me get close. So the only microphone is in your computer, Roger? No. No? I don't know. So, hi, Vince and Brooke. I don't think. I mean, this is just not going to work. Recording in progress. <laughs> Can we stop that? Um, um, it, that that's and different plates. And I Roger set all, up all the components, and uh, I, the thing I didn't check was to make sure they had a signal in the, in the meeting room. Vince, so, I don't know if you're hearing it, but every, <laughs> every two minutes. Um, let's see. This, well, maybe we could call like Mike's cell phone. And I can call you, and we can just conference in by phone. We can hear. Sure, we can, that, that sounds. Hey, Brooke, we can hear okay. you speaking. We can hear Vince now. Are you able to hear us? The other, the other problem with this is that recording in progress every two minutes That's is ridiculous. really disconcerting. <laughs> Welcome to the twenty-first century. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Trails is just digging in the dirt, and we don't have any computers out there, and there's no recording in progress. <laughs> um, but it turns out that the, um, so the, the first thing that Mike was concerned about was apparently there was Recording a in progress. Oh. Can you turn that off? You don't need to record, because we're recording here, actually. Right? Uh, I, uh, hey, Vince, can you turn off the recording on your Zoom call? As part of the PUC process, the Act 248 review for the soul for the H11 project, there was a conservation easement of about seven acres, or maybe exactly seven acres, south of Billings Road that, that's, that I hadn't been aware of. But it's not. Hey, Vince, this is really disruptive. You know, we're, we're trying to have a meeting. We had a room full of people, and this is just ridiculous. Oh, I, 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 I
Vast, I, I think Vast is outside that area. Yeah. But, but, but there are at least those two yeah. trails, and there may be other trails that yeah. will be closed. And um, I have to say, this was not something that we knew anything about. I didn't either. Um, and um, I don't know what we can do about it. Uh, but it's something that I, for one, would like to speak with our council about to see if there's any way to appeal the order to apparently the easement was unbeknownst to the board has been signed on behalf of HED um, without any authorization from who's, the board. Who's the easement to? Google. The easement is from, ostensibly was signed on behalf of Hardwick Electric to Encore, to ER, whatever the name of the project company is. It's ER something, Billings Road project. It's, it's for the life of the PPA, which is 25 years. So, yeah, interesting, because the PUC documents that I read indicated that existing trails could still be used, but... It was, there was an amended order, apparently, in August. There were proceedings. Um, I, we, we have a communication issue. I will, I will say this right now, um, where this board was not aware that there were ongoing proceedings. Um, although technically we were, you know, the department was an intervener. We had council representing us. I don't know why we weren't informed about this. Um, and the first that I knew about this, and I don't, can't speak for other commissioners, but the first that I knew about this was when I got the packet for our meeting on, on uh, Friday, and actually I didn't read it until Sunday, so. Um, but that's, Mike, correct me if I'm misreading this. Um, I believe this was discussed. I believe you were generically aware of it, and I don't believe we had an option to change the items you're talking about unless we said no H11 project. Well, we don't know that, do we? Well, that's what council advised me. Right, but the board didn't know anything about it. Well, I'll let Eli speak to that. Um, we who, certainly who, didn't have a level of Eli. detail that there were going to be trails closed or that there was a proposal to close trails. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yep. Oh my God. So what, what does it say right now? If there are two questions, existing trails, does it just say wintering? Because if they're mountain bike trails only, and if it's only an issue during the winter, I don't think that's a big deal for you, unless you, you were intending to groom all the trails. In which case it would be. Well, it would still mean that people can't use it for snowshoeing. Right. True. Right. But I don't really know what the year of the season is. And it is mind. from the 15th of December to the 15th of April, according to the okay. to the to the easement. Okay. So it's the winter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. It's nicer. The trails are all open for snowshoeing and fat biking in the winter. Yeah. So that would be your intent. That's, is that your current practice? Yeah, but yes. Um, yeah, it's a small percentage of the trail system overall. But? But it, it, until tonight, I didn't realize because what I read in the PUC documents indicated that it would still be okay. open. It's also, of course, you know, the intent is really to preserve the deer wintering habitat. It's a little bit ironic that the snowmobile that's still about to stream through there, that yeah. snowshoers can't cross the snowmobile trail and snowshoe on the other side. Right. But, I mean, but that's, that's not this board's problem. But that's the kind of thing where there may be able to be some modification. If people can speak rationally, there may be some alternative site for the, for the easement. Um, I don't know what, I mean, the easement is now larger. It's now 11 point some eight. Yeah. So oh. what, ha what happened? Because I finally f I found the 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 order just before. So I read this very quickly. But apparently, what happened is that 
the original CPG was violated and there was less deer wintering area. There was, there was encroachment, not encroachment, but there were trees cut down on, the, on deer wintering area. Yeah. So no. instead of seven, no? No, what happened was uh, Encore CPG finally left a very limited, unacceptable width right away for us to build a column, not up to our standards. We had no idea they had agreed to this or applied with that condition. We went down and built our line like we always do. And then the environmental people working for Encore said, oh, what are you doing? You did this wrong. We're like, what do you mean? We're building the line. It's a distribution line. It's not part of your CPG. Well, come to find out it was in the CPG, and they had agreed to conditions that we didn't know about and we didn't need. And we wouldn't have. We couldn't have. Well, and, and what I read in the commission's order is that Encore was going to be fined for violating their CPG. And in lieu of fining them more, they came up with this trade-off of having a bigger deer wintering area than what was in the original CPG. That's great. And, you know, to me, there's a certain amount of chutzpah to be doing, to saying, oh, we'll have a bigger area. It's not on their land. I, I had this argument with them, with Eli, and this is top secret information. But I'm not saying the argument didn't happen. I'm saying that we weren't involved in it. And that's, that's something that we should have been involved with. And, and I don't know what we can do now. Um, it would be good to know from Hardwick Trail's standpoint if this, if this is something that you want us to be looking into, or if these are, you know, if these are nominally trails but you're not using them, then... Well, they're definitely used um, in the summer. And the, and the summer isn't, doesn't appear right. from my reading, and we'll check that with Eli, does not appear to be relevant. I will have to go back and talk to folks who do more snowshoeing and fat biking because I'm not one of those people. So I don't really know. And I'll find out if there's past use that's impacted or not. I mean, it's possible that those have not been you know, traditionally used in the winter. I'm not sure what we can and can't do either, but I would be very, very surprised if um, they're trying to limit bicycles or snowshoes. I think they're just trying to keep snowmobiles off of using those trails. But but that's but that's not what this order says. Uh, you know, I, I I I'm not disputing what their intention. Which maybe the solution is to get a clarifying order that this can be used for skiing and for snowshoeing and winter hiking. I don't know if anybody's doing fat tire biking on them yeah. and fat yeah. tire biking. Probably. Yeah, I would like that. Yeah. yeah. In other yeah. words, non-motorized endeavors. So, yeah, and it might be possible, my understanding, which is, you know, probably flawed, but my understanding is that a lot of this parcel is mapped as deer wintering habitat already, and in the environmental review, uh, that the it, it was, it's, the mountain bike trails are okay in the deer wintering habitat, basically. Whereas like a wider ski, and adding a new wider ski trail or snowmobile trail would not be okay in that mapped area. But I'm not talking about the conservative, conservative part specifically. But. All right, I, I proposed the additional areas to be way on the north of the property and they wanted them down. Where, the, Close. where it was identified as deer area. Uh -huh. okay. So I guess the other thing that I'd like to this board to be aware of is um, Mike consulted with Eli who came back with um, uh, in, in terms of adding another bit of single track that he said, you know, don't forget that this there's an Act 250 permit existing on this land for the gravel pit, so you should make sure that that's okay with Act 250. So I'm going down that road now. I talked to Kirsten Sullivan, who's our district coordinator today, and um, I think it sounds like she'll probably give us a, um, 
you know, if we can show there's no adverse effect, then she can give us a like administrative opinion that we're okay. If there are potential adverse effects, then we'll have to go through an activity permit amendment, which would call both this board and the select board. And that creates a lot of process for you. That's the story. That's the gravel pit north of the existing solar panels? Yeah. Yes, that has the yeah, that right. has the activity permit, which dates from two thousand eight and I believe is a twenty year permit. So it expires in twenty twenty eight. Yep. Yeah. But I think the extraction will be done before then, right? There's like maybe two years left. That's what Tom Fad and I wrote for me keeps telling us we have just a few years left of material over there. Right. So it may be done. It may be done before that. In which case, if it were, if gravel ex extraction was finished and the um, area was all recovered, uh, you could potentially ask to have the permit terminate early. It's the one under Act 250 that earth extraction permits are different from all the other permits and that they can't actually be terminated. The others run the land forever. How many acres is the gravel pit? Twenty seven. And is that encompass the area? So unfortunately the way Act 50 works is once you ask for a permit for the gravel pit, they say, okay, now you have a permit for this entire parcel. So it's whatever the 300, 200, 300 acres? 320. 320. It's a fairly large parcel. So anything else you want to do on that, like Apparently there wasn't coordination this time between the PUC and that 250, but as normally there is, so normally they would have had input during that process as well, that they show up in the process. So. Anyway. So what do we need to do? Well, it sounds, it sounds to me like it would be good if, Eric, if you can find out what trails are involved. Um, Mike, do you have now the easement area that was attached to the, the maps of, of, of that? Because it wasn't in the, in the packet. I believe I have maps of the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, you didn't bring those with I you? I don't have them with you. Okay. Um, yes, I can send them to you. Maybe, it's no problem. I will send them to you. Okay, so if you can send that to Eric and also send that to all of us. Um, yep. both, of, both of the exhibits that are part of the Agreement we should we should have I've got those here. Well, but that that has that has oh it's it's just meets and bounds. Yes, got it. Um, you don't have the meets and bounds. <laughs> um, yeah, so if we could if we could see those and then um, and if those are trails that are being used, if those and and the way this is worded, if there are other trails in the easement property. That, that are being used. Those are the only two that were named, but it says, and any other existing recreational trails that run through. Okay, I'll look. Also, the, it, somebody did put up some signs on those trails saying that they're closed. Really? Yeah. Why would they be closed now? Um, <coughs> because people are confused, I'm not sure. Well, it, the only people who would have done it, it's, 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 is, is Encore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, but it should say that they're closed during the, the deer right. wintering period, right. not, right. so we have a few months before that starts. So, yeah. But, but the other thing would be, and this is, we can have this discussion with Eli when, when, uh, is, is to find out if there's a way to get a clarification at least. In other words, not necessarily reopening the whole thing, but just to get a clarification that that there are non-motorized winter sports use that is allowed on those trails. Because if that's the case, then um, then the deer are protected and so are the people who want to use the trails in the winter who aren't riding snowmobiles. Do you, in, in advance of that additional clarification, do you do you feel it's clear enough now for us to immediately either remove the signs or revise the signs to, to say 
the correct period of the seasonal closing. In other words, we're telling the community now you can't use these trails. If, that, if the signs just say you can't use the trails, those signs should not be there. And Mike, you need to tell Encore to yeah, take them down. Yeah, we them off. Yeah. And those, and those and signs then, should not go up and until it would seem, just before. And it would seem reasonable, I'm just thinking in terms of your, you know, your trail users, when they go back up, they probably should say December 15th to April. Oh, whatever the date absolutely. is. So that people register that, uh, frankly, it would probably be good to say, dear yeah. habitat, trails closed. Well, yeah. hopefully we'll be putting up signs that just say no motorized vehicles. That'd be even better. Yeah. But, but, it, but if, if we have a basis now, because I feel terrible, I think we all feel terrible that a good project like H11 now has this unintended consequence on a, on a really Yeah, I, in all honesty, I didn't know there was a no bicycles or no snowshoeing. I'm problem. just reading the language that's yeah, here. I didn't know that. Yeah, well. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. Well, I didn't mean to hijack your meeting. I just no, this, no. Was, this, was, this was important. <clears throat> This is important, and uh, we don't get the public very often, so we really like to have the public be represented by you, Eric. Select for the same way. <laughs> well, Lynn said immediately when she contacted me about this is we want to support Harbor Trails. We want to help them do whatever they want to do. So that's who else there is. Great. Okay. Any other? Anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> no, but I'll if you don't mind, I'll stay until I have to go. Go. Good. We we're no, delighted to have you. So the next item on the agenda is the responses on the audit findings that we need to put in, and those are in the packet. This is in the audit letter. Many pages. Yeah, unfortunately, yep. they're not numbered. But if you flip, there's some pink. Yep. It's just before the yellow. It's the two last yep. pages before the yellow. Section two. Yep. Well, my eyes glaze over when I read those, so I turn to other people. So, the, so, so they so did a good job, I thought. So I have some uh, proposed responses. You Terrific. Guys can Terrific. Okay. Uh, so the first one was on financial reporting. Uh, the, re the department relies on its auditors to prepare the, uh, the annual financial statements. The department may not have sufficient staff with available time or knowledge or of governmental accounting in reporting to prepare. prepare Mike, can you speak a little louder, please? I, I, I yeah, can't sorry, understand you, I can't see either, so. <laughs> 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 All right, starting over. <clears throat> the department relies on its independent auditors to prepare the annual financial statements. The department may not have sufficient staff with available time or knowledge of governmental accounting and reporting to prepare complete financial statements. And this was the thing Chris talked to you at length about. Right. That small entities such as us routinely are in that equation, so we're not we're not uh, out of the norm. And. I'll just skip down to his recommendation. This is a repeat finding from prior year, and we recommend that management review the current system with reference to these financial statements and related notes, and develop an internal plan for future preparation of complete annual financial reporting. And my proposed response, as you also may remember now, he's looking for a sentence or two to, to respond. So I said, Heart of Electric is well into implement, implementing uh, processes, process and staff changes, SEDC, UPN, general accounting, and customer accounting to provide annual statements for 2021 and future audits, which is all the work we're doing right now to shift away from all the spreadsheets and pull data direct from the system. Yep. Yeah, I don't know that we need to mention SEDC. Can you can you can you say that more slowly? I just want to write sure. it down. Sure. HED is well into implementing process and staff changes to provide financial statements for 2021 and future audits. 
Instead of saying, well, into how about if we say in the process of? Yep, we are in the process of training. In the process of implementing or something? Anybody have a pen I can snarf? Sure. Are you really going to write it? Or do you want me to? You can, you can write it and then read, write it and then read it. Okay. A, all right, HED is in, is in the process of implementing staff and technology. Just remove the word process from the beginning of your sentence. It's just, just say it's HED implementing. is implementing process and staff changes. Process and staff changes. Okay, that was it. And staff changes to enable it to prepare its own financial reports. Yeah, prepare with the auditors, right? Financial reports. I thought, no, I thought the point us, of this is, to, is for us to be really doing want it. Us to be, the goal is to have us do them independently. Okay. Otherwise, they're auditing, auditing their own work. Right? Yeah. That's, the, that's the, the, the dig, I guess. Okay, what I, what I have, HED is implementing a process of staff, a process and staff, no, sorry, I can't read my own writing. HED is implementing process and staff changes to enable it to prepare its own financial statements. Is that enable it to perform this work? Okay. Whatever you guys say. I, I would have said prepare its own financial statement since that's what this was directed to. Yep. Yeah, that's great. So you say starting that's point good. one. But they were auditing themselves. Okay. Let me read it back so I make sure I got it. Sure. Okay, HED is implementing staff process and staff changes to enable it to prepare its own financial statements in 2021. Okay. Okay, the next one had to do with the general ledger. <coughs> Our general ledger uh, included accounts which, which had not been fully reconciled to supporting data. Uh, significant adjustments were required for accrued expenses, pension obligations, and various revenue and expense accounts. Several inactive accounts had small balances but no activity in recent years. So my, my response to this was, uh, A.M. Peisch remedied many of the identified general ledger problems, and HED again as well into implementing process and staff changes to reconcile all accounts on a regular basis. Because again, all this work will get shifted into and out of the system rather than into another world. Any comments? Okay. I think it's fine. Okay. And then the third one was the cafeteria plan. Uh, the department makes no reference to a cafeteria plan in its collective bargaining agreement and personnel policies. There was no copy of the cafeteria plan that could be found and not, no indication should be, of any compliance testing done on this plan. It was also found that employee and employer Social Security and Medicare taxes were being paid on a cafeteria, on cafeteria plan expense withholdings. Um, so what I said was, HED now has a cafeteria plan through the NRECA. Amending 941s is still an open item uh, with our systems provider as well as our tax advisor. And I also want to talk to Scott about how we need to handle this and I haven't circled back with him. Well. So how do you want to word that? Yeah. Where you trail I, uh, I think the important part is we have the plan um, and we're in process of determining how we're going to amend our 941s. 
but we are going to amend them. Oh yeah. yeah. So I think we should I say I think we should say that. that. Right. I think we should say that we're we're Okay, we're, gotcha. You know. And we always had a cafeteria plan, right? We just never written it. No, we we uh, when Jeff Graham was our auditor way back when, but I guess you, but this is before I started. Um, that's where we circle back to Chris reference that he had gone back and talked to Jeff. Uh, we set things up exactly as Jeff had recommended and advised us to do back then, and it was wrong. So, Chris found it. Okay, I, I, I think there are three parts to the auditor's recommendation. So we have a plan. One is one is to have a plan. Yeah. And get current with compliance with that, yeah. which then will mean doing proper withholding and not withholding on the, on the cafeteria plan payments. Uh, the other is amending the payroll returns, the 941 payroll returns. And the last part is figuring out how to um, then get corrected W-2s filed. And presumably, there's going to be money going back to employees as a result of all of this. And we should be doing all of that. Are, are we going to give them what they should have gotten, or are they going to go back and amend their tax returns? Because this isn't going back three years. So I filed my taxes three years ago, and they're wrong. Am I going to get a new W-2 that I didn't have to refile my taxes? Right, that's the stuff that I don't Which may cost more money than what you're going to get back, because it wasn't a lot of money, as I remember. No, it's not much. Right, it was like, for all employees, for the whole three years, it was something about 15000 as I recall. Right, but people have the option. You know, not everybody <coughs> goes and uses an accountant to do their taxes, right. so somebody may want to refile, and they may get, you know, for some people, if they get $1,000 back, or if they get 700 or $400 back, whatever it is, I, you know, I... But they would have that option. Uh, I just wonder if we shouldn't give them what they should have gotten, so they don't have to refund. Yeah, we have, we would have to check. Some liability. We would have to check with 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 the accountants to find out whether right. if we did that, if they're going if they're going to have to pay tax on right. that, whether we have to gross cool. it up. <laughs> right. So yeah. I, generically, I wanted to figure out so if it's. If we're talking about a dollar worth of money, are we going to spend a dollar twenty-five? Right. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I get a. I. I but. Okay. I think the first part of the response, what you said about that we have a plan. Yep. Got that. Okay. That's there. I think the second part is. HED will amend nine forty ones as recommended. And and is consulting with its. Well, they are our accountants, aren't they? Or do we have other accountants? We, are you talking with, with... Chris is who I would serve for, his counterpart, Chris, Chris and Chris. And, and or we're seeking accounting advice on the best way to um, amend... Slash correct. Or correct W-2s or something like that. So... Part one is HED now has a cafeteria plan through the NRECA, and then I combine part two and three. HED will amend 941s as recommended and is seeking accounting and legal, legal advice on doing so. Is that fair? I think that's I think that's fine. Great. Roger. Now you okay yep, with that? You're good. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we probably should have a motion, since this is part of the, <laughs> the financial statements, um, yeah. to, to file, accept. We're prepared to file with this wording. Yeah, so you want to make a motion? I move that uh, <clears throat> Hardwick Electric file this auditor, um, this, the responses that have been read uh, by Mike Sullivan. Uh, to the auditor's report. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Then that passes. And, and the, ne then the next one is the 
marked up in the finals. So I need you all to say the final one is what you approve. So all the handwritten changes were made? Oh, oh, okay. All right, so here's the one. This is the one he went through with you yep. last month. And these are the notes he took Thank in, you, that, in yep. that discussion. And then those are all incorporated Fire. in section four. Agreed. Is there a motion to approve the financial statements? I move to approve the financial statements. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Any further discussion since we discussed these in the last meeting? <coughs> Hearing no discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. So the and financial so statements. You know, I did. Uh, Verbally, Chris and I locked in another two years of service from them. Great. You, you did lock in? Two more years. Yeah. Good. So we don't have to worry about it. They appear to have done a good job. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, should we be patching Eli in now or go on? However you would guys like to do it. We'll I, don't, I don't know what his availability is, so. I'd get him if you can get yeah. him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good. Is Vince still on? Yes, it is. Hi, Eli. Okay, you are on my speakerphone in front of the Board of Commissioners. Okay, I'm on Zoom. Do you know I don't need to do it through Zoom? Uh, that's not really working too great. Okay. We had Zoom failure. Apologize. Did, so <laughs> when you say you're on Zoom, so you can actually, what do you see? Oh, it's just got a, kind of that waiting room message that says, please wait. For oh, that. okay, Start yeah, 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 yeah. You, you'd be waiting. You'd keep waiting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've never had to sit in a Zoom waiting room before. It's uh, never happened. Well, see, it's a first. <laughs> so, Eli, can you hear me all right? Yeah, a little echoey, but so far, so good. So what I'd like is for you to give the team here a, a um, I don't know, a 15,000 foot bullet item of the history of how we had a, the CPG and you know the PPA and the GIA and all the documents were signed and approved. Yeah. And then we went and built the line and there was the environmental issue with the right of way, our standard right of way being in violation of what Encore had committed to, and then explain how that uh, war with me and the ANR went. But, yeah, and I, I'd be happy to do that. I, I think sort of the the moral, or at least the sort of the way this story unfolds is the further the road further down the road you go towards a project um the more you're sort of in a position of having to make sure your developer can actually do the project meaning i think you'll see a number of steps here where hardwick essentially was helping to cover encore's butt to make sure that the project could get built <laughs> but anyways the um so we started off the two agreements we negotiated, and also there's definitely a little mea culpa in here um, in regard to the lease and why this conservation easement, um, you're sort of seeing, probably first seeing it now. Um, but anyway, so we, we negotiated two agreements early on. One was the power purchase agreement, which we call the SPA, the solar power agreement. And then there was also the lease, and um, those were negotiated long before an application was ever put into the PUC for a certificate of public good. Um, and both were, were negotiated as options, so they had an option to lease, uh, to exercise the lease agreement. They had an option to, um, to do the, the power purchase agreement, purpose being, you know, they didn't want to commit to any of these things unless they knew the project was moving forward. So. We executed them in the form of an option. So one of the things that um, came up after
after we had negotiated the lease was that there's um, the project was going to impact deer wintering area, um, which basically just means it's where deer like to hang out in the winter and you know sort of nestle themselves into into the brush and probably there's still some food to eat. But anyways, you know uh, the environmental uh, Encore's environmental consultants identified. Um, that the project clearing would impact some deer wintering area. So I believe that the typical, the, the way that you can turn that, so it would typically be considered an undue adverse impact that would prevent you from getting a certificate of public good. But this was identified pretty early um, by Encore and their consultants, so they were looking for an area um, that they could conserve essentially basically you can't you can't cut down the trees in this area because we're going to mitigate where you cut down trees two to one so there must have been roughly four acres of deer wintering uh, habitat being cut down in the tree clearing so they needed to be able to conserve conserve eight and I think as one of sort of the concessions to help move this project along Hardwick said, yeah, and we'll, we'll sort of allow you to commit to this. We'll find some land um, within this parcel that we can conserve in order to make sure that you, know, you don't get an undue adverse impact determination from the PUC. So that was essentially, um, at that point, reflected in an MOU between Encore and the Agency of Natural Resources. So they... That was part of the evidence that they submitted in the docket. It's something the PUC relied on in issuing it. I think um, because we knew about this early on um, and we had been talking about it for a while, that I had assumed that that commitment on Hardwick's part was reflected in the lease. Um, but I went back to look at it today, and it has very general language about um, sort of assisting making sure that you're cooperating in the in the permitting of the project and, and things like that but it certainly wasn't sort of reflected in in the lease agreement um, which I had thought it was when I looked at this conservation easement but anyway so the original certificate of public good that was issued um, for the project and this would have been summer of 2020 contained a requirement so this is um, Hardwick Electric is, is not a petitioner, and the CPG did not does not um, directly impact Hardwick Electric, but Hardwick was sort of an intervener supporting the petition and certainly filed testimony explaining mostly what the economic benefit would be to Hardwick Electric if the project got built. So um, somewhere in the middle of not a project party that the CPG uh, is binding upon, but certainly participated in the CPG proceeding, got copies of all the filings, we were fully aware of the need to conserve the deer wintering um, habitat. So fast forward um, uh, to, Mike, you'll have to remind me, at some point, uh, Hardwick, um, okay, I'll, I'll step back even further. So as part of the deal, Hardwick was going to build the interconnection. It's going to own and build for most of the interconnection up to a certain point of the project, which means most of the new power line being built was owned by Hardwick. Um, the CPG process does not impact um, the building of distribution lines like that. Um, it's not part of the CPG process, but typical with the PUC, they take a very expanded view of what their jurisdiction is. So even though they can't dictate to the utility uh, how they, you know, what they do when they build a distribution line, they sort of impose these restrictions on um, the developer of the project. So um, when Encore um, in its MOU with a and R, I think somewhat surprisingly to us, that sort of included the deer wintering area um, that would be along the area where you built the, the interconnection line as part of the project. 
So when Hardwick went to go construct that and sort of does what it normally would do, sort of decides based on logic and convenience and cost where the interconnection lines or the distribution line is going to go, um, it impacted a commitment that uh, Encore had made to ANR. So that essentially started a process where Encore needed to report back. And by the way, at the same time, Encore's consultant also, um, or Encore's uh, contractor also violated a provision in the CPG that was issued. So Encore went back and basically said, you know, we're just reporting this. Um, but they had worked out in advance exactly what the sort of mitigation step would be for the additional impact to the deer wintering area. So that that increased the size of the conservation parcel. Um, and that's how you'll see in the amended CPG why there's some additional language. It was really to address two things. It, it sort of increased the size of the deer wintering area that needed to be conserved uh, or protected as part of the permission to build the project. Um, but it also wanted Hardwick um, just to commit there's a little, what they call a riparian zone, like a seasonal stream, um, which I know Mike sometimes cringes at the thought that this would be considered a stream, but at least from A&R's perspective, because it's a seasonal stream, they wanted to maintain some of the vegetation around it. So you'll see there's two new conditions um, in the amended CPG, one was for sort of larger deer wintering area, and the other was just to make sure that um, that the sort of the, the lower growth in that riparian zone um, is maintained during the course of the project. So, Encore um, needed uh, needed because Hardwick isn't bound by the language in the CPG. Only Encore is bound by it and thus, you know, suffers the consequences. What um, what Encore needed was a commitment on Hardware's part to essentially comply with these two provisions because it's Hardware that has sort of the control of the land in these areas. So essentially the conservation easement was really to give Encore permission and sort of the confidence that it could maintain these two conditions. Uh, through the life of the project or the term of the lease. And so that's that document was really giving um, Encore the permission to make sure that these uh, these two conditions are complied with. Um, that was a lot. I'm sure I missed some. Uh, Mike, is there anything you think that's important that I missed? No, um, so that's going to lead us into the next part of the discussion on this, and I'll let Lynn start asking questions. Well, I'll start with, I, I will tell you why, that I am really unhappy uh, about the situation that we find ourselves in, because this board was not involved in any of these discussions. Um, we have a situation where trails are being closed. And again, under the language here, it says that, uh, that there are certain trails which are part of the Hardwick Trail System which are closed to public use during the deer wintering period, which, and it doesn't distinguish between motorized and non-motorized uses. So um, that has the effect of closing trails that people use for skiing, for snowshoeing, for fat tire biking. That we would hiking, like to keep open. Um, that, um, you know, have been, have been <laughs> basically seeded away without um, any discussion. Um, the other thing that concerns me is the obligations that Hardwick Electric, you know, is taking on um, in terms of, as, as you mentioned, in connection with the riparian rights, uh, section two of, of the of the agreement, um, where there are a number of things um, that require best efforts on on Hardwick Electric's part, um, which I, I don't know in Vermont, but I know in other jurisdictions, best efforts is a hair's breadth from a full-on obligation, um, and. 
There's also prohibitions on tree cutting or pruning more than once every 10 years, um, which, which I find shocking um, in the document issued by a public utility commission. So that, I could speak to that one, Lynn. That's, um, that's that riparian zone that Eli mentioned. I understand and what it, it is. Well, can I, you want me to finish or sure. not? Sure. Yeah. So it's a very steep embankment. Literally, it drops off probably 15, 16 feet. It's all rock. And uh, the power line goes right over it. And my trim and crew trimmed it. And the a &R said, well, that's a riparian way. And I said, no, when it rains, there's water running down there. And when it's not raining, there's nothing there. Um, but all they said is we can't, uh, or what we agreed to, and I was aware of this, is that we can't trim in there more than once every 10 years. And when we do, we have to do it by hand. And our trimming cycle is over 10 years, so I didn't think that that was a problem. Maybe that's not a problem. The other, the so, other. I'm having trouble hearing that, but I was going to say my, my response was that to, this was a very small area of yeah. a very sort of deep, Okay. Yeah, it's an area it smaller the than the size of this very room. High above it, and it was really a commitment just to make sure that, you know, what they're worried about is erosion in this area, was to make sure that there's enough plant growth in this area so that if, you know, there was water flowing through there or a strong rain, it wasn't going to cause a ton of erosion, so. Okay, and, and, and if five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, because this is a 25-year contract, correct? Yep, or it could be longer, I guess, if there's an extension in it, but 25 years. Yeah, but, but it's at least better. 25 years. Um, and somebody doesn't. What liability does Hardwick Electric have? Somebody doesn't what? Somebody doesn't uh, use best efforts to avoid all activities that disturb soil and duff, or that doesn't use best efforts to maintain the complex ground cover features. I mean, I, or or tree or 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 the trees grow faster because of climate change and they need to be trimmed after eight years because there's a there's a, there's a chance that, that they're going to fall on on the power line um, in in a winter storm. Um, I have to go back. So there's no uh, liability cap in this agreement. Okay. I mean, your, your, point, your point about, you know, that Encore didn't do everything that they probably should have done in, in terms of planning out the project, and we certainly we want the project, but we're hearing about this as a fait accompli. Yeah, I guess, um, I'm so there was a question about, I mean, that I'm trying to address what I can. There's the, I have to look, there's a couple of things. There's a, there's a management plan that Encore agreed to um, as part of the deer wintering area. Um, I can go back and look at it, but I believe it addresses things like, well, you know, what happens if you need to, you know, at some point manage a trail that goes through there that's used during a non-deer winter. So there is a management plan that applies to the deer wintering area that would cover precisely that kind of stuff. And that is Encore's obligation to comply with the, with the management plan. I think that the... That's their obligation to whom? That's their obligation to ANR or to the PUC. Say that again. To whom do they have that obligation? Is that their obligation to us under the under the lease? Well, uh, it is directly an obligation to the Public Utility Commission. Um, it is, I guess, indirectly an obligation to ANR because it was ANR's recommendation as a condition. I mean, it's also indirectly a requirement under the lease because they're required to comply with all and, uh, and other laws and regulations applicable to the project. But if we're, 
sorry, if we're the ones who breached, because, because we breached one of the obligations in Section 2 with respect to what the owner's covenants are. And I'm not saying it's likely that we will do it. But you know and I know that if you have a covenant, it can be breached. Yeah. Encore did it. Uh, it. It happens. And I don't see anything in this. And this is an agreement between Hardwick Electric and Encore. Yeah. And I don't see anything that limits our liability in this agreement. If, if there is a breach, I don't see anything that, um, you know, can Encore then say, oh, we don't have to supply you with electricity if there's a breach. You know, I, I, I feel like um, we're, missing, we're missing pieces. And I don't know what we can do about this. I mean, one question that I have, not on the liability issue, but on the trail use issue, is, is it possible to get an amendment to the CPG clarifying, or, or even a, a clarifying order of some kind without even having to amend the CPG, clarifying the section, because I believe this language is, I think the language in the grant of easement in A, B, C, D, and E, and I, I, pulled, I, was at, well, I pulled up the commission's order and I went through it very quickly, and I don't have it here, but I believe that the language, at least in D, is the same as straight out of the commission's order. Is there any way of getting something clarifying that when we talk about any, you know, that says that the trails are closed for use during the deer wintering period, that that's for use by motorized vehicles? If they're not, in other words, that, that people can snowshoe, that people can ski, that people can bike, that people can hike on these um, trails. You absolutely can always ask for a clarification, or you know, if the if the clarification says it's you know all all use regardless of you know human mechanical motorized whatever, um, you could move to amend it. Um, I don't have the language in front of me, but I agree that I, I think that the easement uh, just pulls out the specific language from the condition in the CPG, so it should mirror each other pretty much. What, what was the last sentence you said, Eli? Uh, uh, the last sentence that they should, the language should mirror each other in the easement and the CPG. So Lynn and the board's concern, my two, is we don't want to have any limitations on the community using these trails for the things that you, you normally utilize them for, snowshoeing, bicycling, um, hiking, whatever, no motorized sports. Would you anticipate getting something like that uh, defined being a problem? Uh, I would assume that, that I, like I said, have to go back and look at the, the management plan and the language, but I think that is the point is to keep people out of that area so deer will feel, uh, you know, deer aren't prevented or are scared away from using that area. I mean, I'm not, it's probably a better question for a wildlife biologist, but that's, that's my interpretation of it is, you know, this is an area where they don't want people going because the deer are going to be living there during the winter. Yeah. The the deer wintering area mitigation plan mm -hmm. is that I mean that's crystal clear. It, it really does say there shouldn't be any yeah, use of it at all. These trails are closed during the wintering period. Where where are you writing? I'm I'm reading from B. Exhibit B. Yeah. Um, and you may not have time, but I've, I've gone through when I'm driving, and it is crystal clear in being adverse to the trail use. For sure, trail use during the wintering period. And then there's language in it that at least I read as potentially 
This conservation area is a no vegetation management zone. Um, the only, and, and so I don't know how you maintain trails with no vegetation. Yet maintaining trails is vegetation management. So, and certainly building new ones would be too. So we, if, if this is the right document, this basically shuts down any human use of the trails. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And shuts down like any no. maintenance of the trails anytime. Where do you see anytime? I'm sorry, that's the part that I'm not seeing. It's a mitigation area, paragraph sure. three. The conservation area is a no vegetation management zone. And then the second sentence after oh, that says no yeah. vegetation management will be conducted within the conservation yeah. area for the life yeah, yeah. of the project. I see that right. And then it has a clause for invasive species, but that's right. not what we need to be doing. So. No activities of any type yeah. during the entire 11.5 acre area. Well, then it says, yeah, it says, that's the way it begins, and it says no management activities of any kind are committed between December 15th and April 15th. And then in addition, there shall be no activities of any type within the 11.4 acre conservation area during, oh, I don't understand, it sounds redundant to me. Am I missing something? Oh, one is management activities and the other is no activities. Yeah, no, which I interpret as no human <laughs> Yeah. It would be easier for us to make clear to Eli and, and uh, Mike what we want and ask them to see if what they can do in arriving at that. Well, I think one of the questions is, you know, that I have is, is there an alternative site for this? Uh, that doesn't impinge on the trails? Is there some other way of coming up? I, I would bet on it. With, with a mitigation ask. area that doesn't impinge on, on okay. the trails. I, and, 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 this, and what I, again, I find distressing is that that wasn't investigated before <laughs> all of this was done. Um, and True, but so to get out of this, somebody has to do some homework. Right, but I guess the other question is, is, is at whose expense? Because now it's, it's going to be a part of electric's expense, uh, and it should have been at Encores. Um, I don't know that we're talking that, you know, how much expense, but which takes me to something that I think procedurally we need to talk about as a board, which is I think we need to be having a regular legal report every month that's included in our packet that gives us a status update of any proceedings that are going on, um, any filings before they're made. I think, you know, it may not be that, that everyone on this board wants to read every filing in, in their entirety, and it may not be necessary, but I think we have to have the opportunity to review and comment on things before they're filed, to know what the status of filings is, to know what the status of things going in, because I think had we seen this, we might not find ourselves in this situation right now. Well, clearly, it could have been avoided. You know, the giving up, I don't think the intent, I don't know what your intent was, but I don't believe your intent was to give up hardwood trails. No. Existing trails. No, no. I, I don't well, think this, 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 this is clearly my baby and my fault, and, uh, that was not my intention. Yeah, um, I, mean, this, this I was I was operating under the AMI board, signed on to this project and told me to go make it happen. And that's what I was doing. Um, but clearly I uh, dropped the ball on some of this. And my question for you, the, the additional clearing in pink is the right of, is, is our transmission. So, right on Billings Road, where it shows that the original plan was the green, Correct. and then we went wider. We went. They only allowed, I think, it was 20 feet, and we right. need 50 feet, right. so we were 30 feet wider. And, and is that what? That's only one acre. That's what triggered it. But they go. And so they they it, penalize you four to one. But we gave them 11 to one. No, the yeah, original seven, seven was part of the project. Okay. 
Well, so also, also, I believe uh, the reason why it increased additionally was because there's some clearing on the, uh, I want to say, north yeah. yes, that east proposed. side of the project yeah. that they had originally said, oh, you know, we don't want to clear this because it's going to, you know, it's also deer wintering area, but we think it may impact the productivity. And we added to the mitigation parcel because we said, no, <laughs> we want the thing to be as productive as, you know, it can be. So don't sacrifice clearing trees around the project if we have a mitigation parcel. You know, we'd rather just, um, we'd rather use this mitigation parcel that we have in order to make sure the project is productive. So those were the, when you had the increase from whatever to whatever that's reflected in the amended CPG, yeah. it was both um, that's right. part of the clearing for the interconnection line, but also clearing around the project, which um, Encore thought would yeah, you know, they, be important. They added, they added some clearing for the eastern shading of the trees right there at the, at the southern end of the project. I forgot that. And was this a case, Eli, Sorry. of whoever was negotiating, we should clarify who it was, who was identifying and giving the 11.4 acres mitigation area, defining that, who, who was doing that, so they, and how did they not know that there were existing trails there? They asked me to propose areas. Uh -huh. Like I said, I proposed, yeah, why don't you use this area? We don't even have a road up there. We have, you know, way on the north end, the north and eastern edges of the property. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. It's going to be down here. Who said so it? Also have to be, it also have to be filtered through. So it would then go to A&R or Encore's environmental consultants to confirm that this is, you know, actually deer winter area so it could be used as mitigation and then it would be proposed to a and r staff um and their staff would yeah. then say okay. so you know it starts with you know oh geez we have this area yeah. that are you know that's not cleared and we don't have any plans for and then gets put through you know the environmental consultants and a and r okay. to make sure it actually does satisfy the requirement so whoever so eli whoever was working on it knew there were trails because they listed Wayne's oh, yeah. Way and Middle School. They actually gave, they said, these are the existing recreational trails and we're signing up to close them. Yeah, but see, that's the thing is that it's, whoever's working on it is, um, I don't think they have the same investment in those trails. You know, the, the environmental consultant for Encore. But who is representing us? I mean, we, we, somebody was doing legal work here, creating a document that somebody signed. Well, I, it was absolutely me. It's not a document that uh, Hardwick Electric is a party to. I mean, we were certainly aware it existed, but we weren't negotiating these documents between, there's a negotiation between Encore and A&R. And I think, you know, I, I certainly, you know, will, will Per se, you know, I'm not like the the impact of of this on the trails probably is something which we could have had deeper discussions about. But I mean, we had no discussions about it though. That's the problem. And well, but he he discussed it. Change. He yeah. discussed them with me, and yeah. it's my fault. Yeah. But but I think I think again I think there are two issues here that I see. One is. What, if anything, can we do to fix the particular problem at hand? And maybe we and, can. And maybe we can, and, and I think we need to investigate whether there is an alternative parcel that will satisfy A&R and, and get preserve the, the deer over. habitat and still allow use yeah, of I, the existing use and maintenance of, of the existing trails. Because in other words, if those trails can't be maintained in the, in the off season, then, then they can't, uh, then, then they're going to degrade. Yeah, in one year. Um, so, so that's. Um, yeah, I would, I would think, Eli, if the square, 
I would think if the square footage of those trails equaled 10 square feet, for example, and um, we offered to mitigate another acre in, in to what we've already mitigated and put a condition that only non-motorized vehicles are on these trails, I, I would have to believe that's something people can work with at the ANR, but we'll, we'll, we can investigate it and see. So, so that's, that's, that's going to how we deal with this particular issue. But the other is how do we avoid this happening? Because you have a lot on your plate, Mike. I mean, you No, I, you know, I, and, I got two and, stars next to your recommendation. And, and this, and, 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 you know, this, this is, this is not your area of expertise. Mm -mm. Um, and, right, and my mission as, was get this project done. And I done. think we as a board have a responsibility to work with other community agencies to know what's happening. I mean, there have been questions about, you know, not just this, but about the, the IRP filing and, and other filings. And so I think a regular legal report, you know, may take a couple of rounds of figuring out what d degree of information and whatnot. Uh, but just a briefing every month, Eli? I'm totally happy to do that. Um, I just point out that, you know, the things that people, like this is clearly this project is something that you guys would definitely, would be really helpful to have updates, but a good portion of, of Hardwick's legal stuff goes through BEPSA, and I really don't get a lot of in, uh, information from BEPSA, so one that's probably going to be even more useful is is something that's coming from VEPSA. I mean, you could I could try to work with VEPSA to make sure there's one report that comes through, but no, uh, I disagree. But, but, but is, VEPSA, but VEPSA, Eli, yeah. VEPSA, no. But I, we can we can deal with VEPSA okay. separately He's with VEPSA. We talk with VEPSA pretty regularly. Yeah. Um, but you just mentioned you mentioned the IRP, so I yeah I no that's f fair there. enough fair so. enough but 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 who did the IR but who does the actual IRP filing? I know that VEPSA prepared the IRP, but you're still yeah. a council of record on filing that, aren't you? No, that no, would have been done with I Bill Ellis. Okay. Yeah. Well, that and I do that I do the T and D section, and VEPSA does the purchase okay. power parts. But in, in any case, whatever areas you're covering. All municipal items. Um, I, I think I'll we, report. I think we, we we need to have that and we, I would err I would we have to I, vote. I mean, we we have to we have to approve where we're making it. And yeah, before anything is is filed, before anything any contract is finalized, I mean I'm not talk, talking about something small, but if it's a big enough contract that we're getting legal advice on it, um and, and anything that, then that should be coming to the board. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Check that out. I'd say that, you know, just as Mike and I talk uh, a lot, probably oh, sure. sometimes a day, because they'll have a question about like a net metering application and that kind of stuff. I presume um, if there is a discussion on net metering, it's just like a high level. Right. The issue, the issue, Eli, is they don't want to have one of these land in their lap again. Well, I, I, but let's take net metering as an example. If it's a net metering project that's above a certain size, I think we'd like to know about it. Um, if it's a net metering project where we may want to consider whether we're supporting it or opposing it, we want to hear about it. Um, I don't know if other people have any other thoughts on it, but those are mine. Yeah. We, we don't have a choice to oppose it, really. But I'm willing, to, happy to inform you about them. Well, if there's a question, yeah. for example, about uh, system effects, that, that may not be per se opposing it, but yeah. well, that goes into just their having to pay whatever they have the to fix it. They have, are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But but still, if it's if it's a if it's a larger project, and I don't know where the line comes, whether it's 100 kilowatts or 150 kilowatts, I think the commission's line is 150. The commission's line? No, the 
So anything above um, 15 now has to go through different processes. Everything above 150 has to go above uh, through different processes than those. And I think it, from my experience now in many, many years of net metering, I think anything in excess of 150 would make sense to have you guys in the know. I would say I, anything, I can do that. Or, or if somebody's proposing some kind of community net metering that's yep. smaller than that, I think we'd want to know about that. If that makes sense. We do actually so far. <clears throat> but let's wrap up this particular one. What? So we're going to ask Eli. So, this, and Mike so, to, so to Eli, look at it again. this, uh, this. I mean, I, I took a very hard line on this whole thing, and I said, to hell with them. They, how can they commit something for us? We're just doing our normal course of business. Why isn't this on them? And the bottom line was, do we want this project or not? And that's, that's how I proceeded. And, you know, that's where I went awry. Well, well we want these trails open. Can, can, can we do that? We're going to find out. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I think the bottom line is what the what A and R expects is that if you're gonna if you're gonna cut down uh, so many acres of of uh, deer wintering habitat, you're gonna conserve twice as many. Where you conserve them is pretty flexible. I mean, obviously, this seemed like a really convenient place because it was close to the project and Hardwick had control over the land, but clearly. There are some other considerations besides just that. And, and, and when we select, I think you'd agree with this now, if in the selection of the, the other acreage to propose, we definitely want Eric running. Oh, yeah, definitely. In yeah. Town's interest to yep. be part of that. Um, yeah, I didn't even know there was trails over there when this yeah. was going on. I've never been down on that part of the property. Yeah. I just, I would, so Mike, one of the things that, remember I sent you, and we were discussing about not in relation to these trails on the conservation parcel, but elsewhere, is it, am I correct that that whole parcel is subject to an Act 250 permit? That is correct. The actual gravel, I mean, the actual yeah, gravel I mean, extraction I'm area. Not even, I'm not even sure the existing trails there are necessarily legal based on the Act 250 permit. I'm not trying to say like, you can always make them or they could fit within it, but we just need to be really careful because the whole parcel is subject to Act 250. And you really, depending on the impact of the trails, could be either need a, a minor amendment um, or a major Yeah, and that's a good that. warning. So yeah, that per carefully with Eric. I mean, well, that, I brought that all to his attention too, and Eli provided a whole nother eval that I forwarded to him too that included that. But this thing brought up the trail. I mean, this thing, the trails are not silent in here. Right. So. Well, I think there's sort of a no. I think it's already bought those things because there's just no new trails. Yeah. In addition to not using the existing yeah. trails. So in I that, in in that trails, area. Yeah, in, in the, the mitigated area. Yeah, in the 11 acres. Right. But that may be some. Yeah, but their, their plans for the new trails are up on the north northeastern side. So and to the towards the brook to the north too, because that's what I was worried about. Oh, geez, don't mess with another brook. Because that, that's what I went to war with these people about, and that's where my light bulbs were. So, how do you get there? To the brook? No, to this area north of the. They'd have to make a new trail, but that's what they're on doing. On whose land? On our land, or on the towns in Hardwick's land. But it's not in the mitigation area. Right. So that's I was just. That's how this whole follow-up thing came about. Mm -hmm. So I have my walking papers on this, and uh, I will keep you informed on how we progress. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Is that all we needed Eli for? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't um, know. Unless there's anything guess, related to this other than that. Or if there's any update that you want to give us on something else that's pending. <laughs> think so. I think everything we've been talking about is kind of small potatoes, uh, net metering, uh, other stuff like that. Uh, there, well, there is, right? So there is, you guys are aware of the custom consumer complaint that was filed um, by, is it, um, Mike, is it in Woodbury? It's in Woodbury and they're not aware of it. No, so this I, is good. But this is, but again, again, we, we, 
err on the side of inclusivity, and if we're getting more than we want, we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, these are, this, this thing so, is a so, weekly So what event. is this complaint? It's a consumer complaint related to, to um, cutting of trees, which is not appropriate at all for a consumer complaint. Consumer complaint should be based on the electric service Hardwick provides, not that she thinks that uh, Hardwick should be cutting down trees to benefit her property. The tricky situation is it's a former employee of CAPI. Um, the Department and of I Public think, Service. You know, she's a little familiar with the PUC complaint process, but at this point she filed the complaint. Um, we had a response which was, you know, essentially along the lines of, you know, Hardwick has tried to work with her she, numerous times. She refused to let them cut down the trees. You know, we don't think it's really even necessary to, for safety or reliability, so you should dismiss the complaint. Oh, and by the way, it's not appropriate to bring a complaint about cutting trees in the PUC consumer complaint um, provisions, and the Department, uh, Department of Public Service also has to file comments I think they asked for an extension just so that they could, I think they would like to try to just mediate the situation. So um, at this point, we're still talking to the department and I think they're kind of playing it, trying to act as a mediator between the two to see if they can just resolve it. But it's, and I, I did have my follow up with Bill Jordan last Friday. So everything I had is done on that. So, so, okay. so Eli, you say it's not a, a, an appropriate type of complaint. How, how would a customer, I mean, suppose, suppose that there were trees that we should be cutting and we weren't, and a customer came to us and wasn't satisfied, what are they supposed to do if they're not supposed to file a complaint? Well, so typically there's a distinction in jurisdiction. If it's a property complaint, if it's an issue over property, it's a superior court. I mean, there is a caveat to that or an exception that when the utility is condemning property, they go to the Public Utility Commission. But if it's a dispute as to rights related to property, it's a superior court, not the Public Utility Commission. If it's a dispute that Hardwick Electric you know, wasn't charging them the right for service or wasn't crediting them the right amount on a net metering project, that's, 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 you know, that's what that consumer complaint process was made for. So, uh, so, if, so if, if, if we weren't, I'm just trying to understand the parameters of this whole thing. So if we weren't cutting down trees, and then as a result of that, the line came down, and so the customer didn't have power, they couldn't complain to the PUC about that, they would have to go to court for damages? Well, so if, if her claim was that Hardwick was violating its vegetation management policy or, you know, the, the, I think there's some sort of safety standards that the department has implemented. If she was pointing to an actual rule that, that Hardwick wasn't following, then it would be an appropriate, at least, it would be within the jurisdiction of the PUC. I'm not okay. sure it would fall under the consumer complaint um, portion of it, but it certainly would be. But she's not saying that Hardwick's not following all the rules. She's saying, hey, I really want these trees cut down. Uh, we tried to work on it, and now all of a sudden, you're not willing to do it anymore. That's that's more that, that's more of a disagreement between you know two, two people over property rights than it is whether or not Hardwick is actually following. Any of its tariffs or rules or procedures or anything like that. So right. that was just so the, the point I made in the filing was the origin of this whole thing was the pro, like, you shouldn't even be hearing an argument between you know two people who share rights in the same property. Got it. Okay. Anything else? Anyway, so that's no, that's the kind of thing we could certainly provide in an update, like what the status of that proceeding is. I know, that, like for instance, the crash ferry thing is pretty much wound down. I don't think there's any work left going on on the crash ferry consumer complaint. So, nope. you know, maybe if something happened in that one, I would, you know, put a note like that to the legal report. Okay. Thanks.
thank you. Unless anybody has anything else? No, that's good. Okay. Thanks, Eli. Thank you, Eli. Bye. Take care. Bye. So that takes us to page 11 ribbon cutting plans. What an irony. <laughs> what an irony. So, Mike. Yes, sir. Week of October 4 or something? Yeah, I actually got an email today around 11 saying that they their problem with energizing just got delayed another month. Another month? So, so whoever yeah. this, whatever they're trying to work out with the finance end of it is delayed another four weeks. Well, so we're in given the so trail they issue, that's fine. Until November. Uh, no, they were supposed to fire up mid-September, now it's mid-October. Okay, so there's nothing the week of October 4th then. Okay. Uh, we can do our ceremony however, whenever we want. At this I point, there's your celebration. I, I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 this is usually yeah, bad. It's weird. It's a, that's bad karma. Yeah. So, wait, uh, wait, wait. I think I mentioned in the last thing where they were working on is getting a couple of guest speakers. And uh, the PR people for Encore and working for us for VEPSA, didn't know if one of you might want to speak at the thing, too, so I'm supposed to ask that. Okay, onward. Can or few words. No. Okay. So you're a yes? Somebody should say something. I think so. Okay, so Lynn is up. Perfect. All right, so I'll at least confirm that for them and uh, I'll okay, but it's going to be later in October. Yeah, I'll keep you posted. November date. Okay. I asked them to try. They had a bunch of proposed names, none of whom I knew. Uh, so I asked them to uh, look into a PUC commissioner or the uh, commissioner of the DPS. Do do they do they have anybody from the select board from? Uh, any of the, our legislators? Yes, they had legislators. Um, do they have Do they have Chip? They had Chip in there. Yeah, I'm sure they're going to ask Chip. Um, but they had the pro tem. They had other people at Mount Pillar that you know really we don't interact with on a business basis normally. So I think, you know if it's somebody that's uh, maybe a good partner with BEPSA, you know helping us with legislative efforts or something, I'd be interested in that. But. Oh. Yeah. I'll send the list to you. You can okay. give me some. Okay. Send, 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 send those That's what I mean. All the uh, no list. Interest. Overdue. Customer. So, yeah, the next item on the agenda is overdue interest charges for customers. Right. This came up because <clears throat> we're finally sending out our first disconnect notices tomorrow, I believe. I think we're the last utility to start doing it again. How many is that about? How many disconnect notices do we have? I have no idea. I can tell you tomorrow. It's going to be a lot. Um, and depending on what you, I mean, you have all decided that our no interest is still in play because you haven't told me it's not in play anymore, so we're not charging any interest. but. If we're going to do that, this is a good time to transition back so that our disconnects going forward after this run will start doing things normally. Mm -hmm. That would be reasonable. These so there are, is a point, and everybody's in agreement that at some point in time, that special provision for COVID of no interest has to end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The question is, does it end now or does it end later? Right. Uh, I, I would lean on being generous, but. Yeah. Well, we, we, we are the last ones to re-implement disconnect. We've been generous. There's no question about and it. This is, and, and, and we're not getting take, takers on the VCAP and the VRAP? So far, and I pounded that drum again at the select board meeting the other night when I was on TVs, you know, we've only had a handful of VCAP 2 and even less VRAPs. And hmm. can we include a hand of, of a stuffer? Oh yeah, we have one. We have one planned, but it's you know there's 
there's all kinds of money out there for yeah. people to access, and nobody's doing it. If it's you been can, in the paper, if you can it's write been up, on the news. If you can write up something short, I can certainly post it on Front Porch Forum for Hardwood. I can do, do that. Do you do Front Porch Forum? Okay. I don't. We could, we could probably find does somebody. That. My wife does. So, so she could maybe post in, in Greensboro? Perfect. I can do that. Uh, well, we don't have, we use Hardwood. Oh, you use Hardwood. Well. <laughs> officially, we're part of Clover. And so most of us don't Vince, bother. you still on? I, I am, and I was just going to say, I can post it uh, on the Crassberry one, and, and uh, I think Carol Maroney has posted similar, made similar postings for, for um, uh, BC. Yeah, and with the Washington Electric newspaper yeah, I saw that. comes up. They had a nice blurb in there on this topic, so I think you could use some of that too if you like it. So, how much money are we talking about, Mike? How much money is available? No, or you know, are people in arrears? Um, I would say the average one that I have approved is because I have to go into each system and put in a the outstanding bill, copy the bill and stuff. I would say the average one is about seven hundred bucks and the high one is thirty eight hundred. Mm -hmm. so there. There's some people that need help for sure. As a total come down, we should get that report that showed I haven't seen that report days. since Jess left, but I can yeah. get us one. Interesting to see where mm -hmm. what's happening. Yeah. So you say uh, the other utilities around have started disconnecting or just? Everybody has, except us. Really? We're, we'll be the last ones to read. When do you enter the winter? Well, that's it. Soon, so in two months, we're going to go back into the window where we can't anyway. So, so we should hustle. We've got to get a couple done and clean some of this up, is my feeling. Yep. Okay. And do you get a sense more the arrears are kind of like in the towns as opposed to out in the farm? I think the arrears are, are still remain primarily our frequent flyers. I've seen a lot of people coming in making arrangements on their stock yeah. and they want to pay their bill. But even them, I'm like, you know, have you tried, have you tried this, these programs? And they're just not interested. What's, what, do, what do you hear is the, is, do you hear what the reluctance is? No, no, I haven't had a consistent message of feedback from anybody. Hmm. So but like, remember last time on BCAP 1, we very little participation. And we did it, I mean, remember we were knocking on doors, even sticking notes on people's doors. Well, I Bill think stuffers, everything. Let's, let's, try, let's try Front Porch Forum where we can. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm going to add, uh, there's no reason we can't do another. What's the deadline on this? Really is it? On the program, yeah. I'm not, no, there is one. No. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I mean, it is it, available now. It's it, available it is available now. now. And no, it I'm, isn't like it expires soon. I think there's many more months ahead of it. I'm just that. wondering whether maybe also a letter to the editor in, um, the Gazette. Um, yeah, it's worth in, a shot. In the Gazette. Um, Maybe no, the Gazette not. and the News and Citizen? The Gazette might be willing to just do their own article. Or do an article, something. I'm not sure people read these. At least some of these people are obviously just cutting corners, but some are suffering. We, we're also talking in shorthand, and this is being televised, and people will watch it later well, on. I, yeah, this so is maybe, great. Mike, take a couple minutes and explain what monies are available and that people who have arrears can get relief? Yeah, so there's two, <clears throat> the VCAP 1 program has expired, but there is a new VCAP 2 program with even more money available to those people with bills in the arrears at Hardwick Electric and their respective utilities. Uh, very simple application, a very simple uh, approval process for the utility. Uh, Really, it's like a, a page of information for each of us, and it goes right in to be processed. The second one is the VRAP, which is for renter's assistance, and that program is expanded to all utility services. So it might be your water or wastewater or your propane or your natural gas services or your electric services. You can get reimbursements for all those monies that you need. 
as well as rental assistance. And I don't know much about that section of the software because I don't see it in my link. But there's a lot of money out there in these programs, and I really wish more Harvard Electric customers would take advantage of it. And in terms of the applications, we can help people Absolutely. fill out the applications. So, yeah. so people just need to come in. And, not, a, and, not a problem. Yeah. And we can help them get that filled out and get the applications in. Yep. Okay. So the issue, though, is on overdue interest, late payment interest. I don't know. You know, we, we, we so don't know what this fall is going to bring. I would rather table this, leave the policy as it is and, and take this up at our December meeting and, and see what things look like then and yeah. if, if the Particularly when, when right now with the disconnect notice, that's going to be the reason to come in and create a payment plan and get caught up. Then when we go into the winter period, adding interest will be, because we'll no longer be able to do this, disconnects. We won't be able Accruing to Accruing interest is appropriate during the winter, I think. Right. I, I think it, I think it is. Let's I think see. it depends on what. Yeah, let's we see. We, what don't, the we don't know what, what's going to be going There's on. There's no with shortage the of jobs right now. That's for sure. It's right. it's it. There's a shortage of childcare. That's right. There's a shortage of housing. There are people who are going to be evicted soon. Correct. So we should assess all of those. So things. I think so I think we have to look at month? the whole thing. On the interest, yeah. I I would I would table it till till the November. Okay. December. I don't mind putting out public notices, though. That, I mean, well, we're just talking about the interest question. Right. Oh, oh, yeah, there's, right. there's so little yes. that we have flexibility on what we can do for our yeah. ratepayers. Yeah. This is one area no, where. Yeah, we're not talking. I mean, this is something we can do easily. So. Yep. Okay. But I, I needed to ask. So. Yep. I'm fine. Okay. What, by when will you have all the disconnect notices? They'll all be in process tomorrow. I can pull them out of the process tomorrow and tell you anything you want to know. No, but by when will they all be communicated to the rate payer? Hey, by, the end, by the end of the month. The first batch goes out tomorrow. The second batch goes out right at the end of the month. Great. And what's the, and the, that's the notice. When is the actual date of disconnect on a notice that goes out? Okay. Uh, hmm? I'm not positive. No, right. I think you have 15 days to make arrangements. Uh, as long as you make arrangements, you're not going to be disconnected. Otherwise, you may be disconnected on so this, you, this, or this. Would you think it would be October disconnect for a notice? On, on September 20th. For some reason, I'm thinking it's 15 days, but I don't okay. have it. It's it's all put it in October. It's okay. all uh, <laughs> PUC approved it. language on the disconnect notice. We just had to kind of propose a new one and they approved it. So I don't want to tell you and then tell you the wrong thing. Okay, but I can forward you a copy. Then you'll know. That would be good for everybody to see yep. what yeah, a disconnection this notice looks there. like. Mm -hmm. It's going to so, I think we saw one once, but yeah. But it's been a while. Yeah. No problem. Um, any other questions? I'm going to move down to the general manager's report. Any other questions or comments that people have on that? You're going to do, come back to Brooke. And then I'm going to come back right. to Brooke, yeah. Hearing none, um, I think that takes us to discussion with Brooke about public meeting rules and procedures. Yep. Yep. So, we're at. Yeah. Is that going to block your recorder, Mike? Mine isn't working. It wouldn't come on. Oh. So we're not recording this meeting then? I thought he had her audio. I thought we shut off the recording because of it kept. Hello. Um, hey, Brooke. Hi, Brooke. Hey. Can you, Mike, speak up? Can you? Okay. Can you hear me, Brooke? I can. 
Okay, so we're going to start with you on the uh, just a discussion about public meeting rules and procedures. And this is just kind of a refresher course for everybody to uh, raise awareness about the rules in general and uh, keeping us clean from having any trouble from violating them. Is that fair, Lynn? Are you there, Brooke? Yeah. Brooke! Beep, 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 never good sound. Oh, she hung up? <laughs> <laughs> she probably hung up. You better come back and do something here, Mike. <laughs> I didn't touch it. Technology is great when it works. Now you're not going to touch it again, right? Right. Get her voice. Call as soon as possible. Thank you. Oh, there she goes. Hello? Hi. Sorry, we lost you. Hanging up on us? Yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have called you back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so did you hear what I said or no? I'm sorry, I did not. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is give us the you know, 10 minute rendition of the public meetings proper behaviors course. Um, just to remind everybody of what the general rules are and what constitutes a meeting and things we need to avoid, uh, that kind of stuff. And I'll let the I'll let the commissioners ask you any questions they have as we go through. So the floor is yours. Great. Hi everybody. Hi. Hello. So just to um, sort of start at the beginning. What we need to remember is that the board is an entity in and of itself. No individual member can act or speak on behalf of the board because it's only when the board is assembled with a quorum that it exists. And so it's important to remember that actions of the board need to be voted on in public. And all of your business when you have a quorum of officers assembled, and whether that's in email or in person or in some other way, you need to remember that if you have a majority of the board, which constitutes a quorum, you cannot conduct any business or discuss any business outside of the public realm unless it is part of the exemptions for being able to, for the board to meet in private. And there are a number of them, um, and they are for protection of the business or the employees or the private information that should not be shared in public because it would put you at a disadvantage or it's just not an appropriate time um, to make uh, notice of the, the decision making until the board actually makes an, an action that's in public session. So, the whole idea is that, you know, boards are not, public boards are not allowed to proceed or make decisions in private. It's um, incumbent upon you to make sure that the public has the opportunity to listen to the interchange and conversations that ultimately result in your actions that you take as a board. So, along with that, idea of making sure that you're operating legally. Um, we also need to remember that nobody talks to press or takes a position or states that they are able to act outside of the group consensus of the board. Um, and so for example, you know, um, board members don't can't come into the office and start ordering employees around, or um, they don't talk to the local newspaper about what Hardwick's position is about a certain issue. Um, unless they are given the authority um, through a vote of the board for a delegation of their authority to act on behalf of the board to make a decision or what have you. So those are the real basics, and all it has to do with is just the idea of the public having 
access and an understanding of what public officials are doing in their positions on behalf of the citizenry. Um, so along with that idea is if there are business matters, for example, to be um, dealt with between you know boards, uh, either the town board or your board, um, those are conversations that need to happen in a way that is appropriate and within the confines of the authorized vehicle, the, the individual who is asked to step up and meet with somebody on behalf of the board, that kind of thing. Um, do you want me to stop and see if there are any questions on any of that? Oh, that sounds good. Brooke, just to clarify, so when you say if there's a quorum, you can't discuss any business unless it's a public session. That means the session has to be warned, right? Right. And even for a non-public discussion, doesn't that also need to be warned? Well, any time that a quorum of the board is in a forum, whether it's like on an email exchange. You know, we don't want any secret conversations going on among a majority of the board because that circumstance means that the board is meeting. And so you're not allowed to meet without telling the public and inviting them to come and listen. So that's why it's important whenever you have a quorum that is constituted. I mean, it could be a cocktail party. And if, you know, four of you are standing around having a conversation and somebody says, hey, what do you think we should do next week on the vote on such and such, that would be improper. That would be violating the law because you are then in a conversation as board members and there are enough of you to constitute the quorum. And we're trying to protect against that through email communications. Now, having said all of that, that's about the substance of the business of the board. We're not talking about sending out emails that say, hey, let's meet on Tuesday, and somebody responds and says, I have a doctor's appointment, and why don't we try the following day, you know, whatever. We're distributing materials. That's perfectly fine in advance of a board meeting. If you want people to be prepared and review materials, they can be sent out to the whole board. But in response to that, the board should not then start talking about it and saying, hey, I see in such a, such a document it says X, Y, and Z. I think that we should do this thus and so. That is not permissible. You have to wait until everybody assembles and you have the actual board meeting that's been noticed to the public and people are invited to listen. Okay. So, so a group email is okay with information, but people shouldn't be responding to it. Correct. There should be no substantive discussion whatsoever. So you but but you could that. respond by saying, Got it. I, I, I received it, I'd like to see this on the agenda. Sure, the next absolutely. Okay. Can you in any way have an executive session? Well, you, can have, you still have to notice, like if you wanted to have a board meeting, yeah. Just so you're going to have an executive session, you still have to warn it, whether it's, you know, it would probably be a special meeting, it might be an emergency meeting, so you have to give the proper time okay. period notice. Okay. And when you open your meeting, you open it officially, and then you would just state, we are now going to get into executive sessions, stating yeah. on the record what the reason is, <clears throat> making a finding if it's one of the ones that requires a you know, premature knowledge of the right. public would be detrimental. You make that finding, and then you go into executive session. In a normal way, right? Right. Are and then when, the executive, and it, when executive session is over with, you come out of the executive session, you note the time, and then you adjourn your meeting. Right. Are there any emergency exceptions? <clears throat> well, the emergency exception um, says you can hold a board meeting if it's an emergency with no notice, basically, 24 hours if you can get it out, but 
it alleviates the notice requirements so that if there is a true emergency where the board needs to meet, they do it. And, you know, it may be a notice that goes up and says we're meeting in three hours, but um, you still have to send out the notice even to convene an emergency meeting. It's just a much shorter time frame for the notice. All right. It's not relevant here, Brooke, but I'm on a committee on a town issue in Greensboro where there are three members. So anytime I see any either of the other two, we're always in trouble. Not as long as you don't just don't talk about the business of the board. It's it's impossible. But anyway, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, it can be challenging. That's for sure. And, and, and I am enough to be able to ask a question. Yeah, I think so. Just speak up. Speak up loudly, Vince. One machine will be talking to another. So, I mean, it, it, it appears that any discussion that's deliberative or decision making is, is excluded or has to be excluded. Now, what about, I mean, research informational, asking for additional information, you know, in the interest of being then prepared for? Uh, the meeting or for deliberation. I mean, if, where there's no deci decision making, it's a request for information or That's also, fun. you know, I mean, it's a, it just seems like yeah, a fine question line. Is. Do you hear that, Brooke? Um, I'm not, I'm not really clear what the question is, Vince. Can, so you're saying there's a fine line between, like, if you get an agenda and then you want more information in advance of the uh, meeting? Well, actual discussion between board members that isn't deliberative, it's not decision making, uh, but it does contribute to the ability to be prepared for the meeting. For instance, mm -hmm. I, I can give you an example. Uh, so you need more information about a particular contract. I mean, it's not about whether you're not deliberating what you're going to do with the contract, it's just information in order to be prepared. I, I know just looking at the Secretary of State's uh, website and then going through the, the, the this, this is actually a point that's specifically made that that kind of information and research and preparation discussion can be excluded, but you know, with, with caveats. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I, I guess erring on the side of um, um, caution is best. But I see it, being, it, it could be a substantial impediment to being, to being prepared for a meeting. Vince, are you talking about asking one person for information that they have, or are you talking about have, talking to multiple people about it? Uh, that's a good question. I guess multiple people, but I, I guess it could be broken down into individual discussions. That, that chain, as you mentioned uh, earlier, Lynn, uh, could be considered a, a, a group discussion. Yeah, I don't. Brooke, you can't, you can't, you can't do, have serial discussions on the same bilateral discussions to avoid the the public meetings rules. I see. Yeah, you know, I I think that a, that a beneficial way to view it is to maybe look at it procedurally versus substantively. If, if Mike sends you your packet of information and you look it over and you say, hmm, I want to know what our, our contract was for last year with our other vendor, because now we're deciding if we're going to change vendors. So there's nothing wrong with you emailing Mike and saying, hey Mike, can you give us either a summary or shoot me the contract from last year? so that I can understand the background since, you know, I haven't been around or, you know, for whatever reason. That's perfectly fine. But you don't want to send an email to a quorum of the board that says, hey, I was just reviewing the contract, and it has a provision that says X, Y, and Z. I don't think I agree with that, and I think I want more information about stuff from last year, and, you know, because that's when you start to get into the discussion. <clears throat> where, where you're having a substantive conversation about the topic that 
the public should be allowed to hear if it's something that's not going to be in executive session. And so, and, and, you know, there's preparation for a board meeting, but there is nothing wrong with going to a board meeting and listening to the presentation of the CEO or, you know, wh- whoever is talking about it. And then to say, well, what about this or that? Or is there other information that might be beneficial? So um, what I'm suggesting is maybe the follow-up or the conversation about it, which if it should be happening in public, happens, and then additional information is followed up on. That's a different way to handle it so that you don't get, you're not tempted to get into a debate about it before you get to your meeting. Because the whole point of the meeting is for everybody to come together and to discuss and make decisions. And now, I, want to, I do, do want to circle back and talk about one thing that you were discussing, and that is exceptions for deliberations of the board. That term, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure which section of the guidance document from Secretary of State that you're looking at, but what you need to understand um, in terms of the different roles that municipal boards play, there are um, there are quasi-judicial hearing and decisions that are made by some of our municipal boards, like a zoning board, where they conduct an actual hearing and they decide, are we going to give a variance or a zoning permit to Joe Blow, citizen who came to us? When Typically when the term deliberations is talked about and the exemption to public meetings and, and you know, it's not an executive session, it's a deliberative session. That typically refers to being within the universe of a quasi-judicial job of a board, having to make a decision like a judge or a court on zoning, for example, or a tax appeal, or um, we're going to discontinue roads and we're holding a public hearing and the guy who lives on the road can come and talk to us. And after they have the hearing, they can then go into a private session to talk about it, to figure out the law, to get memos from their lawyer or have their lawyer talk to them. Those deliberations are a different kind of executive session. But I would be cautious in terms of thinking, oh, if we are using the layman's term deliberating about something, that is not what deliberate session is. And to my knowledge, you guys don't engage in quasi-judicial functions. Right. You, do, you don't sit as a decision maker. Um, anything. So be cautious about the notion that as long as you think you're deliberating, whatever that means to you, that is not what deliberative session is. It's a very unique where you guys sit as a quasi-judicial board making legal decisions that can be appealed to the court. Good distinction. Yeah. From my understanding of the only times that we can go into executive session really are one of three things. Either Maybe, maybe, maybe four. Uh, one is um, if it's if it's discussion of an of a ongoing or potential litigation matter where public dis- discussion could prejudice the department's interests. Another would be to to get legal advice on on a matter um, that where there may be a dispute, maybe it hasn't risen to the level of, of litigation. Another would be if there's a customer matter that needs to be discussed because business relating to a customer is confidential to that customer, um, or to discuss an employee matter um, related not more, not generally but to a specific employee, um, or or I'm coming up with more or or a contract negotiation. Um, where again we need to have a discussion mm-hmm. uh, where having it in public would prejudice mm-hmm. uh, the departments and ultimately our ratepayers' interests. Is it? Is does that? Uh, yes. Uh, 
Anything? Is there anything else? Um, I was trying to think as you were ticking off the exceptions. Um, let me think. Um, yeah, I think you pretty much covered them. Yeah, there are a couple very specific ones about um, negotiating a contract for the sale of land or something like that. But yeah, you know, it, there has to be one of the statutory reasons to meet in secret. And even and then, then we have to announce ahead of time that we're going to be meeting in secret. It's a public, yes, it's, it's a, yes. the, the discussion is secret. The, the meeting is not. And then, Correct. And what are we obliged to say publicly when we come out of executive session? Nothing. The no. only thing that's important in terms of executive session is recording the reason why you were going into executive session and then you record the time you go in and the time you come out and that and you never take action in executive session because you're not able to. You can only take action in public session. So for example, we were we were able to meet in executive session to talk about settlement and whether to accept the settlement offer and all of that. And so we all understood, we were able to ask questions and you folks you know, came to your own conclusions through that process. Then what we had to do is come out of executive session and then you had to vote on whether or not to accept the settlement that was a public decision. If you had said no, it would have been a no. And it would have been recorded in the minutes. If you had said yes, it would have been a yes. So while you can talk about it, you can even take a straw poll, you can't actually do anything official in executive session because it's in secret. The only time you can make a decision is when the public views you making a decision or you issue a written decision. And that's yep. typically in the judicial, you know, quasi-judicial arena. Well, we do it well then. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys have been, uh, has historically over the 12 years I've been involved, you guys have done a great job, and Mike's been very, um, really Johnny on the spot in terms of his due diligence to make sure that the board operates and has all the information ahead of time, and um, I think he's done a marvelous job keeping the board informed, so um, yeah, I think you guys are doing a good job. I wish I could say the same for your town. <laughs> Um, any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thanks. Certainly. Okay. Um, Looks like we go into executive session. So. When it, and let me just let me just jump in. There was one other thing that I I meant to mention because Lynn talked about serial communications, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and what that, you know, there are a couple different ways that boards sort of get around these rules or try to. And one, you know, for example, one board member calls each individual other board member and talks to them about the, you know, the matter. I mean, those are the kinds of things that really are not in the spirit of the law. Um, technically, are they violations? Well, I think that once you put them together, you know, the even with the best of intentions, um, I think that this is circumventing the notion that the public is supposed to be privy to these to the decision making process. So um, I think that you know you got to play it straight. And there's no reason to um, load the jury, you know, if you will. Um, just talk about it in public. All of the concerns that you folks have, you're all very smart people. You're very, um, your heart is in the right place for the utility. And I think you're, where all of you come from really adds quite a bit of quality to the discussion. 
and the public is entitled to see this conversation and a robust debate. And so it's not a bad thing to discuss difficult issues in public and to wrestle with them and to allow the, your electorate or your ratepayers to observe that process because that's where we um, really address all of the issues that you come up against and you come out in the end serving the citizenry in the way in which it was intended. Did we just lose that? Was, that was, uh... No, I'm okay. still here. Oh, we heard a beeping, sorry. There's a lot of beeping going on in this meeting. Okay. All righty. You want us to go into the other session? Yeah. Just pass that to me. That's a question. Gotcha. But got truncated. Well, thank you. Not the whole thing, yes. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we go into executive session uh, to discuss legal issues associated with council, associated with 